Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Karl Marx originally identified two great classes directly facing each other, the bourgeoisie and the workers. Later in the Communist Manifesto, he identified two additional classes, which he believed would decay and finally disappear in the face of modern industry, the lumpen proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie. And it is that group which Marx called the smaller capitalists that we will be discussing today in his brilliant new book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, The Unstoppable Rise of the Petty Bourgeoisie. Dr. Dan Evans explains to us why those old labels of working class and middle class have become useless in the face of a rapidly changing British class system and a political system increasingly influenced by the petty bourgeoisie. Dan, thank you very much for coming on. No, thanks for having me, mate. Um, so how did you come to write this book? The book is quite, is very personal to me. The reason I uh, decided to write a book about the petty bourgeoisie in many ways, it's just been a topic I've been thinking about my whole life, and that is rooted in my own personal history. As I say in the book, the first, I, my my PhD uh, is about national identity and social class in Porth Call. And obviously, anyone who knows me knows I'm you know absolutely obsessed with Porth Call. Like I love it. I think it's the best town ever. Um, most people think it's just like a strange little pokey seaside resort, but I really like it. Um, and throughout my adolescence. I really rest, you know, social class was something I really, really thought about, you know, possibly a bit more than other people. And one of the reasons that I thought about class so much is that, if, you know, growing up in Porth Call, you know, in Bridgend, um, because obviously it's a couple of weird things, like we played football in the, the Talbot League, uh, a couple of anomalies, but, um, you know, Porth Call was seen as a posh, a posh town. You know, I was, and by extension, I viewed myself as posh or middle class to, to sort of intellectualize it at the time. And, you know, relative to the other parts of South Wales, the surrounding areas or the tourists that used to come to Porth Gaul or still do come to Porth Gaul, um, you know, I thought that was the case. You know, we are, you know, I was like, well, we're, we've got more money than, than sort of the the, well, the South Wales Valley's hinterland. Um, and there was this always, and, you know, class was very visible, especially if you go to Porth Gaul between like locals and tourists, and it still is visible. And so my framework for sort of starting my PhD was like Porth Call is a middle class town. The rest of Wales is working class. Um, but then obviously, you know, as I sort of dug deeper and then I reflected on my own personal trajectory, I'd been to university. Um, and when you go to university, like as you will have probably experienced yourself and a lot of other people from similar backgrounds, is you do meet people there who are, you know, what we would call really harsh, like really properly middle class, you know, people who are, whose parents are doctors, people whose parents are, you know, lawyers who are going to be army officers or, you know, politicians or, or other things like that. And then I, you know, that's not what Porth Call is. You know, Porth Call is not generally those people. Porth Call is people who are, you know, self-made men, people who've moved to Porth Call from the rest of South Wales, you know, builders, plasterers, electricians, and then it's their kids that then go off to university and have this weird liminal like interstitial sort of position, but where they don't really know what class they are, my working class, my middle class. So what I um, eventually concluded was that, you know, Port Gaul isn't a, a middle class town, you know, because middle class or tr professional middle class people, that's not their lives, it doesn't accurately describe Port Gaul. And, and Port Gaul was a petty bourgeois, uh, is a petty bourgeois town and a petty bourgeois experience. And I originally started to think about the, the cultural signifiers of the low middle classes, which is obviously, you know, fresh grey velvet. Everyone talks about the, the cultural signifiers, the aesthetics. But then you start to think about politics and how this relates to, you know, broader trends. If you're on like left Twitter, it's just people, why are the Tories, why does everyone vote conservative? You know, why are Tories in charge all the time? Who's voting Tory? You know, I don't know any of the votes Tory. And then I was like, well, I know loads of people vote Tory. Uh, you know, my whole town votes Tory. And, and, and you know, and obviously being Bridgen, Bridgen, went Tory in 2019, it's a swing seat. And you start to think, well, I can tell you why people vote Conservative. And this rooted in the the culture, the political culture and the life experiences of this particular class, because they are and they have been the basis of modern, the social main social base of modern Conservative politics, as well as the main social base of the, of the emergent far right, as well as like driving Brexit you know, Trumpism and so on. So in very, very, very circuitous way, that's why I decided to write the book about it. 
brilliant <laughs> so because because so much of what you you know you talk about your own personal story in the book it resonated with me as well you know a lot of people for a long time have considered me to be sort of middle class but you know growing up in Roth in Cardiff my mum was a nurse my dad worked in steel but I've always felt very different middle class to some of the people I went to school with whose parents were like you said doctors lawyers yeah. and when I went to university in London I very much did not feel that working class that middle class anymore but just so everybody is listening knows is not as well versed in um class theory how would you describe this idea of the petty bourgeois what are its sort of origins in that sort of Marxian term and you also I think make a really interesting distinction between the old and new petty bourgeois in the book and would you be able to explain that a little bit yeah of course um yeah I've been trying to sort of simple I mean trying to simplify this stuff I didn't say drove me to like a mental breakdown but like you know there's two very interesting uh theorists uh you know you know Nikos Palantas who I draw on in the book and like Eric Olin Wright and they both I mean you know Palantas literally you know he killed himself. I don't I'm not saying it's because he had to think about the petty bourgeoisie all the time, but like, I, I don't think that would have helped. And then Eric Olin Wright sort of spent his entire life wrestling with the question of like the middle classes. Um, and it is something that's very complicated. But, you know, in Marxism or in the Communist Manifesto, you know, uh, or in you know, Marxist political and economic writings, the petty bourgeoisie were just defined as like small, small capitalists, small business owners. So it was very narrowly defined as sort of small tradesmen who own their own means of production. So when we say the means of production, we literally mean like he owns a little workshop or he owns a shop. So he's like a shopkeeper or in Marx's time, that would have been a small craftsman. So, you know, typically someone like uh, a carpenter or, you know, today plaster electrician. Um, but obviously back in the day of the guilds and the artisan trades, there was a lot of different types of skilled trades before, um, manufacturing was like large scale you had people making small scale commodities in a little workshop so that was the the original if you want like if you if you will like the the classic image of the petty bourgeoisie and it mark sort of said these people are are fascinating he says they're cut up into two people so they're both because you know if you think about the worker or the proletariat proletariat has to work yeah, you have to work and sell your labor under capitalism. Otherwise, you you can't live. You starve to death. You can't have. You can't pay your rent. So all of us now, me, you, and most people listening, will you know, well, we have to. You have to work. You know, you have to. You have to work to live. Um, and that's what the petty bourgeoisie, petty bourgeoisie have in common with the workers. But what separates them from the workers is this ownership of small, you know, their, their own means of production. So they are they they are their own boss. So they exploit them. They exploit themselves, and often like their family, and that's what separates them from the workers. That's an important distinction. It's not just an economic category. That is a whole way of life. Because working in a a factory, say like a work like a working class working on the line, working in with all your mates, uh, is a very different experience from the isolated experience of working on your own. So that's the old petty bourgeoisie you know so, so they have the interest of the worker and they sort of have interest of uh the bourgeoisie as well so they're sort of in this weird liminal i, I can't believe i've used that word i think twice already but like uh that that middle middle it's just in a very strange uh space in the class structure and it's and mark sort of said that this is you know this is a class which is transitional by which he meant it's going to die it's going to die out like the aristocracy because as you move to large scale manufacturing in the industrial revolution, you know, there's no need for small, small capitalists because everything, uh, everything's going to be industrialized. You're going to have larger, large factories, things like that. And you're not going to have any need for this, this small, uh, sort of strata. But then obviously as I argue in the book, this is like, this didn't happen. It survived and it's now grown. So that's the old, um, and then in, in, in the, and this is the bit, and then the new bit is the bit in the book, which I think a lot of people will disagree with. Um, historically, it's a, you know, cause it's not my, uh, it's not my thesis. Poulain Sass was the one who came up with this idea of the new petty bourgeoisie. I'm just, I just agree with it. So I've tried to popularize it. Um, and there's this idea that me, you, a lot of the people, young people who go on protests, who formed the social basis of Corbynism, uh, Bernie Sanders, um, you know, Saritza, Podemos, this like over-educated 
uh, underemployed white collar group, you know, across the UK now, everyone, everyone will probably know that there's groups of people with master's degrees, undergraduate degrees, working in call centers, working in coffee shops or whatever. My argument in the book is that this group actually constitute a new petty bourgeoisie. So they're like a, a new version of the old petty bourgeoisie. And they've got a very different in many ways. Like they obviously, the traditional petty bourgeoisie never went to university. Um, they, the traditional petty bourgeoisie tend to vote right wing, whereas the new tr uh, petty bourgeoisie vote left wing. But there are fundamental things which they share. Um, specifically, they focus on social mobility and this the individualism which comes with that, which make them sort of part of the of the petty bourgeoisie as a, as a class. So, what I'm arguing is that the class is like a DNA helix. You know, not not that I know anything about like biology or DNA or anything. I just know that that's it looks like a what it looks like. So there's two strands which are interlinked, which make the whole unit. And so one is old and one is new, and they together form the petty bourgeois. I hope yeah. that explains it. Well, it's fascinating. You describe it, you know, as this ever increasingly large group, the petty bourgeoisie. And I think the old petty bourgeoisie that you described is what a lot of people involved in politics for a while would have called the sort of Mondeo man. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. to delineate that between this sort of, um, I, I know you use it a little bit in the book, but this sort of like liberal managerial class is essentially what you're trying to get at, right? The UK and understanding of class in the UK is, you know, as I, I sort of say in the introduction to the book, is is really chaotic. It's a country that's absolutely obsessed with class, but no one actually knows what class is because we reduce class to like this set of cultural signifiers. You know, whether you like avocado or whether you like chips or whatever, and you know, and your consumption practices or how, what your house looks like and things like that, and and that's how people define class, and that's why everyone in the UK, by the way considers himself working class despite all evidence of the contrary but um what's important is when we talk about the middle class and we throw that and that term is used a lot now in politics isn't it the middle class or whatever the middle class is not this big unified thing you know it's not a homogenous class and what i'm arguing in the book is that the middle class broadly speaking is split into two and you can say there's a lower middle class which is the petty bourgeoisie you know so as you said, Mondeo man, Essex man, all the people who were alleged to, you know, uh, Thatcherites, people who bought their own council house, doing right to buy. That's like the low middle class. And then you have the upper middle class, which is professional managerial, what I call the professional managerial class. And I think, I personally think there's, there's a real distinction between those groups. I know some people think that the, you can class them all as the new petty bourgeoisie or just class them all as middle class, but I think there's a, a distinction to be made both in sort of their class interests, the culture, the political culture, their values. Um, and yeah, so as you said, Mondeo man, the, the interesting thing about uh, the petty bourgeoisie is that they're continually referenced in British political culture, but they're never actually identified. So when, you know, commentators, like liberal commentators talk about ordinary people, you know, Keir Starmer's got appeal to ordinary people. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't resonate with a man in the street in the Red Wall. You know, he's too much of a, this lefty nonsense doesn't resonate with uh, real people, real hardworking people. What they're talking about is the petty bourgeoisie. You know, they, they, there's this weird thing because we think of class in terms of culture. People think about the Red Wall. This I think it's a stupid term, but let's, for the sake of this discussion, let's, the Red, you know, we'll talk about the Red Wall. Um, there's this idea that this voter, that uh, this homogenous class structure, and these places are made up of like, you know, white working class people who are like all reactionary. And there was a tendency for like when, during Brexit in particular, when journalists went up to these places, they were like interviewing people who were giving them sort of right wing sound bites and, and things like that. Um, but very often they were speak um, because petty bourgeois, people from petty bourgeoisie, you know, are culturally very similar to the working class. You know, they live in the same areas with the same accents. People couldn't tell a difference. You know, it was almost like a confusion species if you're into bird watching, which is what like I like uh, I am. But um they were routinely confused with the work the working class. But it's this sort of specter, you know, if you're if you the liberal commentary app know that there's out there beyond the pale in London, uh, outside London, there's this group of people who are deemed to be extremely reactionary and like quite scary and like nativist. Um, and they're constantly referred to and everyone's got to appeal to them by being like ever, you know, 
turning the right wing dial up on the the policy or whatever. But what I'm saying is that group is never actually defined. It's just this, you know, people talk about it, but they never actually uh, talk about it with any precision. And, and, and generally speaking, that group is the petty bourgeoisie and it is extremely large. It's extremely influ influential, but you can't really understand all this stuff about Mondeo, Man, Essex, Man, you know, Middle England, swing voters or whatever, unless you actually um, sort of hone in on this class. And the way I think you can do that in the book is actually by returning to quite obscure Marxist theories that, that ex explain this sort of experience. It's relevant because everyone, I think everyone knows the class, but it's just never really identified as such, you know? No, it's interesting what you say, Dan, because it's so true. I think that people have a tendency to reduce their own class analysis into into really ridiculous but easily understandable things. So it's the sort of analysis that would make you think that Mike Ashley's a working class guy <laughs> even though he's with billions because he's got a Midlands accent, you know, it's that kind of analysis that I think leads us to where we are. But I want to kind of get with you about how you think that say, you know, from Thatcher, how, how do you think this class analysis of British politics has worked? Do you think, do you think we are getting better at understanding class or do you think we've got much worse? Oh no, we've got way worse. And um, so what basically happened, I mean, it's funny because this is one of those arguments I, I've sort of come to, not that I'm, I'm obviously very old, but like relative to some of the political theorists I'm right, I was reading, you know, I'm, I'm young. Um, and they, they were, you know, in the nineties, there's all these like Robert Brenner, uh, Sivan and people like that are talking about this like retreat from class. Uh, and what happens in, you know, sort of with the era of progressive neoliberalism. So, you know, like Blair, uh, uh David Cameron, uh, Clinton's, uh, there's this like this mini economic boom across the world. Um, and people sort of started to, insofar as they talked about class, they didn't really talk about the working class. The assumption was, oh, the working class are all middle class now. And there was all these articles, apparently, we're all middle, you know, everyone's middle class. And what actually happens, you know, it's funny because whether we think we're all working class or whether we're all middle class depends on how the economy is. So, like, during this boom period, everyone was deemed to be middle class. And all the articles like, are we all working, are we all middle class now? Now we're in a period of austerity. You know, it's like, oh. We're all working class now. Um, but what happens is that sort of the the class distinctions just get overlooked. But yeah, essentially what happened in the as I argue in the book in the nineties is the left abandoned class. And in its place, uh, it started talking about you know social movements, race, gender, uh, identity, all those all those things, because the working class was not seen as the motor of politics anymore, because the working class um had sort of been defeated by Thatcherism. So it was like, well that they're no longer going to change society. So, um, so no, class analysis essentially disappeared. What's interesting now is we're coming back to class analysis belatedly, um, but the problem is we don't have a theory of the middle classes in particular uh, as a way of understanding modern politics. So, you know, if you look at what happened after 2019, when you know Corbyn lost, it was a you know, traumatic experience and everything like that. There's been like a raft of good articles by young you know Corbynistas who are sort of starting to talk about class again and saying, oh, you know, whoa, we, the Labour Party didn't appeal to the working class, and it didn't. You know, like in 2019, I think it was the first election since since in living memory where the majority of low income voters, for the first time ever, voted Conservative. So there's been a massive dealignment. You know. Uh, in terms of the relationship between class and politics that the the young left just hasn't grasped um but i but i but i just think that as they're coming back to class now which is really good it's really good that people start talking about class you you need to be able to talk about uh you need to be able to theorize the middle classes um and one of the things that i argue in the book is a mistake is that as we come back to class now people are really tending towards what i would call a dualist theory of class which you you know so this idea as you said in the introduction about there being two classes you know the working class uh or the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and you see that in things like the 99 percent which was drove, drove drove the occupy movement uh and then corbynism you know for the many not the few and what happens there is that there's this assumption oh there's this elite there's this big global elite and there is a global elite you know there's a big global elite and then outside that we're all the same you know this idea that the working class is expanded and i'm arguing that that is a dead end you can't understand what's going on in politics and society if you think that 
everyone who works is working class, for example. You need you need to be able to theorize the middle classes. You know, Thatcher obviously changed British society. It was a total revolutionary moment. She, she uh, was it Stuart Hall called it the great move in right show. Uh, you know, she just dragged British society so far, so far to the right. And Thatcherism, when we talk, you know, when we talk about it, we often just talk about it. It's, it's just synonymous with neoliberalism. Or Thatcher was the start of neoliberalism. And she was. Um, and then when we talk about neoliberalism, we think about neoliberalism, neoliberalism as being about the transfer of wealth, you know, from the working class or everyone else to this elite. And that's what it was as well. But Thatcherism had a, a class basis. So Thatcher, you know, I, I find fascinating. I really think she's really, she's really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, not going to go for like this weird left Thatcherism or whatever, but like Thatcher had a acute understanding of class. She had a really, really mature, I mean, she said class was a communist concept. Yeah. She was like, oh, I don't want to talk about class, but she had a far better understanding of class than sort of any subsequent Labour politician and even the Labour politicians at the time. And the reason she understood class so well was because she was like the personification of the petty bourgeoisie. So she came from Grantham. She was the daughter of a shopkeeper. You know, all she talked about was the values of the shopkeeper, the values of the low middle classes. And she understood like the petty bourgeoisie and what motivated them, like their prejudice against the working class, their prejudices against the upper class. Intimately, I think Christopher Hitchens at the time, I think it was Hitchens, he called Margaret Thatcher like a Pujadist uh, female, you know. Um, and there was another New York Times column about her at the time, and they said she is Grantham writ large. So they, I think it's in the crown, you know, Thatcher didn't like the Queen, uh, and people were like, I can't believe that's true. But she didn't. She, she hated aristocrats, and she delighted in sort of like rinsing all like the posh, the posh lads in the Conservative Party because she had that classic petty bourgeois thing of, she, I mean, she genuinely did hate working class people. I mean, she hated them. And that's like a classic sort of uh, one of the pathologies of the petty bourgeoisie. But she also didn't like the aristocrats as well, because the, the tradition of the petty bourgeoisie is the assumption that us, you know, we're the hardworking people that keep society going. Then you've got the lower class beneath us who are like lazy and feckless. And then you've got the upper class who are also lazy and feckless. But anyway, what I'm arguing in the book is that she sort of took those values of the low middle classes, the, the petty bourgeoisie, and she made them hegemonic in British society. And she's and and she actually uh she what she wanted to do was just transform the class structure back to, you know, this this gilded age where, you know, there was no proletarian masses to sort of ruin everything. It was society was made up of like you know, chocolate box houses and small and small shopkeepers. And she, I argue that she largely succeeded in doing that. And if we talk about British politics now, I think we can all agree there's like a hardness, like there's a real hardness which defines it, I think. You know, like people, is like this, not callousness, but this individualism that runs right through it. And I think you can trace that back to Thatcher, but you can't really understand Thatcher unless you understand the class from which she came, which is the paper bourgeoisie. But Thatcher wasn't a middle class movement. Thatcher lost the professional managerial classes, you know, by by gaining the work, large swathes of the working class and gaining the low middle classes into this like big Tory coalition, the progressive managerial classes with their socially liberal views were sort of horrified by this like nativism, this like right wing populism and this like national chauvinism. And they went over to the Labour Party. But, you know, you can't understand that if you just think of the middle class as being one group, you know. I'm going to build in a couple of things from there, Dan, because a lot of people say that Blairism and New Labour were a natural evolution of Thatcherism. They sort of took that social progressive uh, managerial class that we just talked about as a sort of bedrock of the Labour vote, but then sort of appealed to this authoritarian desire within the British people. How, what would you say what the class uh, analysis of that, of that Blair government has been? Blairism was extremely extremely chaotic i thought like composite movement so like in policy terms yeah undoubtedly it was a straightforward continuation of thatcherism you know it, and, and he did you know the blair government did many things that the thatcher government were just like well we, we can't do that that's too right wing two of the main ones obviously being uh introduction of tuition fees like thatcher's education secretary proposed it and it was like nah that's that's too much. Um, and then the other one was um, the privatization of the Royal Mail, which was originally, which obviously done under the coalition, but it was originally mooted 
by Peter Mandelson. Um, so yeah, Blairism was a continuation of, of Thatcherism. But what I argue in the book was that the class basis of Blairism was was very different. You know, so what happened? Blairism, I think, was rooted in this professional managerial class, which massively grew. You know, he grew his base in the same way Thatcher grew her base. So Blairism or new labor in general, whatever, is is rooted in the professional managerial classes. And actually, I mean, the book isn't about the professional managerial classes. You might view it banded around as the PMC. The book isn't about the, the PMC, but um, I think that they're a fascinating, really important class. They're almost like the, it's like a yin and yang of the two major political actors at the moment. And I think the petty bourgeoisie is one and the PMC is the other. But Blairism, like particularly the authoritarianism, of Blairism is like in, indicative or reflective of some of the ideologies of the professional managerial class. Um, the, the roots of the the idea of the professional managerial class come from Barbara Ehrenreich, who's a sort of sociologist. She just recently passed away last year, um, who proposed this idea of the managerial professional managerial class in I think the seventies or eighties, looking at the rise of this class. And one of the interesting things about the ideology of the professional managerial class is is that it's simultaneously very paternalistic towards the working class. So it says, we want to help you. We want to help you. Um, but it's also extremely authoritarian towards it. So there's this weird like dialectic of like, you know, we know what's good for the working class and we're going to help you. But, you know, there's also this essentially scared of the, uh, and they sort of hate the working class really. Um, and if you look at sort of, you know, what Aaron White, Aaron White was saying is that, that that ideology is sort of like, I don't want to, name like teachers or social workers but there's almost this paternalism of like you know we know what's best and you really see that in blairism you know these like sort of these small concessions to the working class but you know deep deeply authoritarian mindset in, in, uh and also like i mean i will well, i'm sure we'll get into this later but like also you see it in like wales to an extent now but this sort of policing of the individual in terms of like your you know banning smoking uh policing of like micro habits because it's like you're feckless, you shouldn't do this. The flip side of that is extremely socially liberal. You know, so Blair was obviously, you know, uh, I, I think he repealed Section 28, um, the homophobic piece of legislation that Thatcher brought in uh, and was very progressive on things like identity politics, just like Clinton, extremely socially liberal uh, with uh, combined with authoritarian tendencies, particularly regarding the working class, which sort of need to be least so i want to talk a little bit yeah about the modern left now and building on a couple of those ideas you talked about there dan you said there's a great line you've got in the book about the left labeling anything they don't like as bet as petty bourgeois because it's yeah. easier to deal with that idea than the idea that the working class have the quote-unquote wrong politics so do, do why do you think that the modern left struggle with the idea of engaging with working class voters with whom they disagree i do think historically that it is interesting that so much of the slagging off of the petty bourgeoisie was done by Marxists and leftists who are actually literally from like aristocratic backgrounds, you know? Um, and there's just like, I was like, whoa, like you really hate low middle class people. Um, but obviously the working class are sort of abstract to these people and therefore they're seen as, they're seen as saints and sort of pure. Um, whereas, you know, the, the, the petty bourgeoisie are sort of reactionary, sort of scumbags and they're like latent fascists therefore you can sort of say anything and i've always thought that there's like a what's it called a projection or subliminal you know it's it's basically a way of like laundering this like hatred of the working class but you say well it's the petty bourgeoisie uh, yeah and yeah and the, and the problem is related to that is that the petty bourgeoisie has become because it's seen historically as like a social basis of fascism which it was you know it was it was but it was also the social basis of social democracy and like chartism and things like that there's no, nothing innately right wing about it but because it's seen as innately reactionary uh you can just use it as a punching bag and and, it, and like a lot of things in in the uk uh it's it's just used as an insult it's just as a pejorative you know this is petty bourgeois that's petty bourgeois um and you know all the greats did it as well like lenin and stuff used to just call anything that they thought was individualist or selfish or like anti-collectivist, they just say that's petty bourgeois and, and the British left do that. But obviously the irony is that I, I argue in the book is that the, the, petty, the, the, the new left are actually comprised of the new fraction of the petty bourgeoisie. So um, it's funny that they, 
you know, they're slagging off themselves, really. You talk a lot about how they're very quick to compile people into sort of binary good and evil rather than trying to understand why people don't agree with them or vote for them. Well, that's that's one of the biggest problems in 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 modern politics. Um, I mean, I never thought I'd be the guy who sort of talk about being kind online or things like that. But like, um, I really, I mean, one of the the biggest uh, examples of how the, the modern left has sort of internalized liberalism for me is that it stopped thinking about politics. It seemingly, anyway, to me, it seems to have stopped about thinking about politics in terms of structures, uh, and it per- personalizes everything. My take or my assumption after sort of a too long spent on the left among like you know le- leftists or lefties now is that there's a real transition to like if the Tories win in the UK is because everyone is selfish, everyone's reactionary, everyone's terrible, we're all terrible people. Whereas us, you know, the left, the lab- implicitly the Labour Party, we're all virtuous and like great people. And there's this really weird binary divide. It's quite strange because, like, you know, in in Marx, he always talks about like you know the dangers like personalizing things, and you know the, the fact that people are just reflections of their class of their sort of class position. You know, you can be the nicest person ever, but you just re- you know you're reflecting your class interests. He sort of says you, it's it's not it's not personal. And if you read like Lenin, you know, he sort of says exactly the same. It's all about building class alliances. But there there is this real drive to personalize politics. And I, I think that's a a hangover or uh, a result of sort of modern liberalism uh, sort of penetrating the left. And in a way, it's indicative of the uh, the domination of the left by the PMC, because there's this part of the PMC ideology is this idea of, well, Catherine Lee has got a book called Virtue Hoarders, but it's this idea of personal virtue. So a lot of this is literally, I mean, again, I appreciate these these terms are often used by the right, but and I don't normally use the word virtue signaling, but that a lot of the time is what it is. You're saying this person's a scumbag. I've got perfect politics on the other hand, and you, you know, obviously, you only have to spend a tiny amount of time around left wing groups to realise that a lot of these people are not perfect people, and in fact, no one's perfect. You know, and in fact, no one is born in the in the neoliberalism with perfect politics. And the whole point of socialism and like leftist politics is to actually win people over. Uh, and that was always that always used to be that always used to be the way forward. And the the point of politics now should be building class alliances. You can't build class alliances if you if you're writing everyone off and calling people you know thick, stupid. Obviously, I know a lot of people disagree with me, especially in Wales. But one of the watershed moments for me, which made me realise and reflect upon my own sort of position and I guess my own anomalous position within the left, or like how I sort of was, I started to really realise how much of a bad. Uh, trajectory the left was on was over Brexit um, because I was sort of really shocked by the things people started to say about people who vote for Brexit. There was a real snobbishness, almost like, you know, veering into eugenics a lot of the time. Like, you know, these people shouldn't be allowed to vote. Assumption that everyone who voted to leave um, was like fascist. Uh, and there was a real disconnect. Funny enough, I didn't actually have uh, that strong opinion at the time, you know, about about Brexit and I didn't actually vote because I was in the Euros, but um, it was the fallout afterwards that really shocked me. And that was when I started to think, well, why are we personalising everything um, and not really understanding politics in terms of structures? Yeah, the Brexit does feel like a bit of a watershed moment, doesn't it? And not Probably not um, for everybody, but for me, at least, it's definitely this moment where you start to feel this definitive right versus wrong Yeah. Uh, narrative 100%. approach to basically everything if you disagree with and me I, on brexit you're wrong on everything else basically yeah exactly exa- exactly a litmus a purity litmus test i'm gonna say it was a culture war because obviously we are engaged in like numerous culture wars at the moment but brexit polarized people uh to such an extent it in put people into the really entrenched positions which then mapped on quite uh uh straightforwardly onto like covid response for example again i don't go into it too much in the book but i have written about it elsewhere a lot of that was indicative of the professional managerial class, and I, I think you can. I think I can overstate this. You know, like this idea that there's like this, this remain this like this stereotype of the remainer. You know, this like professional person who's like you know got a great life and doesn't and uh, thinks everyone else is uh, a fascist. And I think that can be overblown. But I think there was an element of, you know, this sort of professional class, this progressive class that hadn't really ever lost. They never really lost anything. Uh, they never not had their own way in politics. Um, and then all of a sudden they'd like lost something. 
and they couldn't handle it. And it was like the response was like, well, we'll just keep rerunning it until we win. Um, but, you know, I don't mind getting sucked into a debate about, about Brexit because I'm sure, you know, I know you guys have covered it a lot and I've talked about it a lot and it's extremely tiresome. But um, it is interesting to think about Brexit, I think, in, in terms of the class composition, who voted for Brexit, uh, who was against Brexit, who's, you know, thinking of the, the class interest people had. And one of the things I sort of uh, tangentially sort of touch upon in, in the conclusion of the book was, yeah, and I, I know people just couldn't comprehend, you know, why people would vote for Brexit. And obviously at the moment, like the postal workers are striking, rail workers are striking, and both of those unions at the time were anti-EU because the EU had privatised mail uh, across Europe and it's privatising rail across Europe. And so from the position of those workers, it was extreme, a totally rational way of seeing the e the EU as something which was like a privatisation machine. But again, because we've sort of started to personalise politics, rather than viewing this as like a like a trading block, it was viewed as like something which was just this uh, personification of all that is good, you know, globalisation. But there's also this uh, calculation uh, and you know, people have to sort of reflect on the fact that the life experiences of people who thought the EU was very good, so going on Erasmus schemes, holidays to like France and Spain, being in the front of the line, and all those things, and m m mobility around the block are not universal experiences. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're, they're good, but it's just worth people reflect on the fact that those are classed experiences. Those are not experiences that many people actually have. They're, you know, they're sort of quite narrow in that the most people who would have benefited from those and therefore would benefit from continued membership from the EU are, you know, are graduates. Whereas, um, you know, for people in other industries and in other parts of the UK who didn't go to university and didn't have those experiences, they had a very different view of the EU and sort of bureaucracy. But yeah, listen, I don't want to get sucked into that as a debate, but it's, I just really think it's important that people start to think about things in terms of class, class interests, but, but also even in terms of what drove Brexit. You know, Brexit was driven between different fractions of the ruling class. You know, there's one sort of a, almost like a nativist, protectionist uh, element. And then there was like the globalized element, you know, like represented by David, personified by like David Cameron and stuff. And you can't understand that if you get sucked into like this idea of like culture was good. Some people are good, some people are bad. Who just thought after nearly seven years, we'd still be talking about Brexit? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Well, another thing I really like in the book is you talk about this uh, authenticity of the modern yeah, yeah. left, the desire yeah. to appear more working class than you actually are. And certainly I think everybody knows someone like that. And, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that accusation made towards some politicians as well in, uh, across, across Britain. What, what do you make of this phenomenon? It, well, it's uh, authenticity, obviously, is, uh, or the author, authenticrats is a book by Joe Kennedy, which came out in 2018, 2019, I think. Uh, it's a fantastic book. And it just refers to this modern phenomenon of British people essentially cosplaying as working class. Um, but the deeper issue is about how we understand class in the UK. And so because we understand class, not in terms of like, you know, your job or what school you went to or your education or your relationship to the means of production, we view it as a, a cultural thing as as i said before where the, what food you like people can then demonstrate being working class by their proximity to these weird cultural and aesthetic signifiers so it's like i don't like you know coffee is for posh people you know and all that and then obviously it, owen smith had the one with like frothy coffee and um in ponty although someone said you know by all accounts apparently that they do actually call it frothy coffee and that cafe whatever but you know andy burnham saying about people coffee drinkers um and then obviously then it's ridiculous because these people are professional politicians on 100 grand a year um and they're pretending to be sort of salt of the earth um working class people but again all that is is, is this mass ventriloquism and like laundering of particular opinions and, and and obviously it was happening in with bernie sanders in america as well people were saying i think i can't remember the guy who said it but he said something like the people who shower after work or shower in work you know, don't vote for Sanders or something like that. But it was, again, this like particular signifier about meant to mean, that you know, blue collar workers don't vote Democrat anymore. They vote Republican. I mean, obviously there is a, a big grain of truth in that. And obviously the more candidates like Jeremy Corbyn and uh, Bernie Sanders emerged, it was even more important for sort of, you know, centrist or right-wing politicians to portray these people as being out of touch 
with ordinary workers. And, you know, the way you do that is, as you said, deploy these strange cultural, cultural signifiers. You know, Jeremy Corbyn is from Islington, you know, he's metropolitan, he's out of touch with people. And that was a, the British context. And I do rec, you know, everyone should read that book because it's really useful. It's also must be really depressing for Joe because he sort of identifies this phenomena and describes it brilliantly. And then it just keeps happening. It's not like people go, oh, okay, I won't do that anymore. It just it intensifies. But obviously it's happened a lot. It, it keeps happening a lot more in the, in the US, you know, and like, you know, the, the, the right have very successfully deployed this uh, narrative that, you know, Democrats or liberals are sort of out of touch metropolitan elites who are out of touch with the working class. And again, the thing is that that's, that is true, but uh, it's also the case that the people deploying those allegations are themselves part of this elite as well. Um, and so it's just, this, like I said in the book, it's, just, it's mass ventriloquism. You know, there's professional politicians who have no connection with working class people accusing other professional politicians of having no connection with working class people. It's, it's really gross when you think of it because all they're doing there is using the working class as like a punch bag or a punch line anyway. It's basically saying that like, you know, the working class are, are thick, like racists. And if I adopt this like reactionary position, you can legitimize it by saying, oh, well, that's what working class people want. Or, or are you out of touch with it? I think it was um, Angela Rayner. Um, I can't remember what it was. Some, someone like there was a, a shoot, shoot to kill incident. Maybe it was the London Bridge terror attack. I can't, I can't, can't remember what it was. I can't remember what it was, but all Angela Rayner was asked about Labour's approach to crime, uh, and it, and I think someone uh, talked about John Charles de Menezes, and it was like, shoot, would you shoot to kill? Would you do the shoot to kill thing? And she was like, yes. And then another Labour MP was like, that's a proper working class opinion. These middle class lefties wouldn't know about, you know, I don't know. I was like, what what don't we know about, you know, the desire, the working class desire to like extra judicially execute someone like I, you know, it, but it was, but it was a classic example of just a, I thought quite an abhorrent political opinion, which was laundered and legitimized by saying well, that's just what working class people think, which is obviously not true. I want to talk for a second about uh, social mobility and the, and the concept of aspiration. So my, my dad was always, you know, I remember having a conversation once with my dad where he, he worked for this company and, and my granddad worked for the same company. I said, um, Oh, when I'm older, I work for that company too. And he took me, he basically put his hand on my shoulder, looked me very sternly in the face, and went, "No, you absolutely bloody won't." He, he had this idea that for me, he always wanted me to do better, to not work yeah. in manual labour like he and his father had done. But what do you make of this idea that the left has rejected aspiration, and do you think aspiration is a good thing? Yeah, I have like a really complicated relationship with person, uh, you know, person with social mobility, um, because I mean, as I say in the book, most families people about you know in their 30s or whatever are products of social mobility um because the welfare state saw you know massive improvements in people's lives the grammar school system saw like real so, you know limited but real social mobility for people there was a whole a uh, whole generation of like labor mps for example who wouldn't have been labor mps without the grammar school system they then got they then did away with it social mobility in the abstract or or not even in, you know if, if you remove it from its abstract thing it's a uh, it's a noble thing everyone wants everyone wants their family or their loved ones or their kids to do to do well and that's really it's really important and back in the day and you know and obviously my old man and my granddad in particular had exactly the same for me you know we want you to go to university we want you to have the thing the opportunities that we never had and that's an extremely noble thing and so many people have had that not pressure but so many people have been encouraged to you know to to go to university and make some of this stuff and for a while you know, if like in the seventies or eighties, when going to university was a minority experience, it was a legitimate and uh, almost guaranteed route to actual social mobility. You know, you were going to be X, Y, and Z. You you were going to be a professional. You're going to be a teacher or an accountant or you know a lawyer or something like that. Isn't it? And particularly in somewhere like South Wales, where there was a culture, and there is you know there is a residual element of that culture of manual work. Which is, and we romanticize it. We do romanticize these communities and these experiences. We forget that these are extremely difficult jobs, like extremely difficult, dangerous, dirty jobs with um, huge, huge risks. And for good reason, a lot of these men and families who are doing these jobs and living in these communities 
which were very you know close knit and I is a fantastic thing. They wanted people, you know, they, they wanted their kids to, to to do something different. So there's a couple of things. The, the the first thing is that social mobility is always jarring. Social mobility is always hard. And social mobility is generally the low middle classes. Generally speaking, the working classes, even if they had aspirations, generally speaking, the working class have historically been static. They haven't sort of moved up. There's like this intergenerational transmission of working class values. And there's also this intergeneration, traditionally, this intergen intergenerational transmission and reproduction of working class boys do the same types of jobs as their dads do for various reasons. But obviously, small elements would be encouraged to leave. And like Richard Hoggard in The Uses of Literacy talks about how all awful but it's very difficult for the kids who actually go on that journey you know it's very hard for the kids who went to the grammar school to leave their old community behind because you've got to sort of don a new identity you've got to create a new identity um you've got to sort of reject the values of your community you've got to essentially pretend to be somewhere else and then you go to university and you've got to keep doing that it's basically what happens to a lot of people and especially now you leave your, your mates and you go to university you might not really want to want to go or you might not even know why you've been encouraged to go the difference now is that that social mobility route uh, is encouraged en masse. But the problem is the economy has changed so rapidly. Degrees have been, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Degrees have been devalued so rapidly. Higher education has been massified so rapidly that that social mobility aspiration, all it really does is going to lead to uh, downward social mobility or at least blocked social mobility. Uh, and that's certainly the case. That's certainly the case for me, and I certainly I know it's the case for a lot of people across, not just the UK but across the world. I mean, if you look at the statistics and actually the you know the quant political science breakdowns of the people who vote for Sanders, for Corbyn, and Podemos and stuff, they are graduates working in non-graduate roles. And I think it's like I I use the stat in the book. I haven't got it to hand, but it's like four million, maybe five million, something like that, graduates in non-graduate roles. So in in roles that they didn't need a degree for, they're now like lumbered with loads of student debt. Um, and that's the reality now. I don't know if you saw, there was a video going on on TikTok um, and it was interviewing those two electri union electricians in America. Did you see that? And they were in being interviewed um, and this woman was asking them, what do you make? And they were making, you know, a lot of money and they were saying, we don't have any college debt. And it went viral, this clip in America and on the American left in particular, because people were like, I should have done that. You know, I should have done that instead of being where I am now, which is like working in a, a coffee shop or working in a call center with hundreds of thousand pounds or whatever of student debt. So on the one hand, who doesn't want what's best for their kids, you know, and, uh, but the other hand, the reality is that that route has been closed as being, and, and you know, it's not as been closed off for everyone. I mean, like if you want to do finance, for example, or if you want to do like law or medicine, certain professions haven't been degraded, you know, like you could still get, you can still achieve social mobility. It'll be really hard, but you can still do it. But um, this lad I follow on Twitter the other day, you had this really interesting uh, reflection. He said, well, you know, he went to university and has done well, but, you know, this, a lot of people now are going to have this strange situation where we're overeducated. And when we have kids, we'll have to think to ourselves, do I really want my kid to go to university knowing what I know now that that is not the route to social mobility? You know, will they then say, oh, you should do a trade and stay where you are because that's the key to a better life? it's going to put people in quite a strange situation because, you know, what are you going to tell your kids? You know, I, I mean, I'll probably, I want to tell my kids, definitely, like, don't end up like me. That's, but now it means something different. It means get a trade. Don't end up like your old man who's like, like a, a man child in his mid thirties with like temporary contract and no, no life skills. You know what I mean? I want my kid, want my kid to be, to be happy. So, you know, I'll have to think long and hard about the sort of trajectory, the route I want him to do. We've or talked her. about yeah. We've talked we've we've talked about education so much. What 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 do you think of the role of education in the modern class structure? And what what's your assessment of educational attainment being used to determine voting behavior? I think everybody's seen this kind of attitude and that sort of thinking that if you are university educated or not, you vote a particular type of way. Yeah. Well, there's. On the, there's there's a, dip, a number of approaches things. Some of it, like again, edges towards like eugenics. You know, this idea like if you're uneducated, you shouldn't be able to vote. Um, we don't deserve to vote or don't deserve to live or whatever. Um, and obviously education 
and educational qualifications have traditionally been used as a proxy for class anyway, you know, um, but what's happened now, Thomas Piketty has got this uh, theory called like the Brahmin left. I don't know why he picked Brahmin. Brahmin is like a caste in India, but yeah, all the statistics across the world now show that the base of like progressive parties um, is not actually determined by income, it's determined by education. Um, but what's really happened is the only reason they're focused on education is because there's a cohort within that group of overeducated and poor people, which is the new petty bourgeoisie. So what the progressive classes relationship to education is, is that first of all, you've got to realize that the progressive classes and people vote for progressive parties. In reality, that's like a coalition, an uneasy coalition of professional managerial classes and the new petty bourgeoisie. And if you that, if you look at the Labour Party or the Democrats in the US as the sort of paradigms, that's, that's where you can see the fact that these are a coalition of the, the these two classes. One of them are very well educated and rich, and one of them are very well educated and poor. But the point is, you know, there's there is a correlation at the moment between education and um, prog- if you want to call progressive parties, obviously differences i don't think that these parties are progressive or socialist in any way but um there's a more there's a deeper point uh about you know the ed- relationship between education and class so you know when i was writing it you know and again with this book a lot of it i'm still i'm still thinking it through myself you know I, I, and i'm wondering you know is it does education count as a a hard class divide you know that's something I'm going to sit on the fence about. I'm not saying that like having a degree makes you middle class or new papers or whatever. But what I think is important and interesting in um, from Pulantzas is actually to think about the actual role of school and education in society and uh, in splitting off uh, the low middle classes and the working classes. If you want to be upwardly mobile, which most of us do, then you have to be you know, you have to do well in school, you have to pass your exams, you have to pass your GCSEs, you have to get, was it a C in English and maths, if you want to do, be a nurse, if you want to be a, like a certain other sort of public sector professions, you have to take school seriously. So what Pulantza sort of argues is that school is where the working class and the new petty bourgeoisie get separated. And the difference is that school is essentially rejected or not relevant to the working class who do not care about social mobility. So if you don't care about social mobility, then you don't have to care about school. Whereas if you care about social mobility, you have to pay attention in school. And there's like a, a number of anecdotes in the book where I talk about, you know, school essentially, I can't blame school, but, you know, I gradually became separated from my friends from primary school in secondary school. And we were like inseparable, me and my friends, but, Gradually, what happens is you get split off by be put, put in different sets, by being encouraged to take a different path. You're going to go to university. You are not. You're going to go do a trade. And the school system itself actually splits people off into, it filters you into different uh, roles in the economy. And, you know, just as working class people are sort of filtered off to go and do X, Y, and Z job, nowadays, school is essentially about training people, you know, the new petty bourgeoisie, new generation of white collar workers essentially to work in call centers and to do white collar uh, jobs. And all the, if you have, I don't know if you've seen the civil, if you've ever applied for a job in the civil service or like the Welsh government, but all those skills, those weird skills that they want you to have, like delivering a pace, like dealing with change, all that nonsense, like, you know, the to- total, total bullshit. Like no one really knows what it, those things mean, but you know, at, the, at its core is they want you to, sh- they want you to be someone who is deferential who will play the game, will be polite, you know, will sort of defer to authority. And that's what qualifications and stuff are about. They're not about whether you're actually are good at maths or English or whatever, or anything like that, because we don't actually get taught any much that's useful in school. But it's about inculcating a set of values, including like deference to authority and to this obedience to the system. That's what it's about. And, that, and that's what a degree and that's what GCSEs and stuff actually show is that you can... You know, you can work to deadline, you can work in a team, you know, all these, all these sorts of, sorts of things. But there's a deeper thing there as well, which I mean, again, I'm not sure, I'm, forgive me for talking about because I'm, I'm still working this stuff out in my head, but like 
Blantz has said in society there's like a divide, uh, an unspoken, intangible divide called like divide between mental and manual labor. And he basically says that the working class are essentially on one side of this line and everyone else can sort of see them, you know, and everyone else knows they're the working class, you know, and they've got their values and we've got our values. And essentially, that you know, he's saying that his school that sort of is one of the places where you get split off, where if you're aspirational or if you're upwardly mobile or if your parents want you to go to university, then school is a place where you start to think, oh, I'm not like, I'm not like the lads that mess around in the back. You know, I'm not like the lads who don't take school seriously. I've got to take school seriously. And you start to internalize this ideological divide between, you know, yourself, what I call the new paper, you see, and, you know, and, and, the, and the working class. Or, you know, that people who don't, the lads who didn't have to take school seriously because, you know, and, and, there's, and if people are interested, there's a whole host of literature about, the relationship between education and class and how work, the school, the habitus of the school clashes with the habitus and the values of working class people. I don't know if that answers the question. So. No, that was great. The, the, I was just going to say that so many of the sort of ideas in this book, the sort of perfect case study for it all seems to be the 2019 general election. It was this election that was covered as though it was like the complete rejection of the Labour Party by the working class, with Labour seen as this part of, you know, the party of the middle class liberals. Mm. The Tories claiming to be the party of the working class now. Though when you dig into the data, you, you know, you've highlighted some figures already, but then some, one of the biggest markers of who you would vote for was still whether you owned a home. Although, as, yep. you, as you identify in the book, uh, home ownership is often not a helpful indicator of class in sort of all situations. But what was your analysis of that election? And do you think the sort of small c conservatism that's always portrayed as some of the working classes as voted as sort of converted into the working class now being constantly behind the conservatives or do you think there is hope for for change there so what basically happened was you know the, the tory party in as you said earlier the, the low middle classes uh were essentially you know thatcher sort of bought off large swathes of the working class through like material concessions like right to buy she bought off small businessmen by boosting you know she grew she grew uh the amount of self-employed it i think it was like one point something million at the start of her tenure and at the end it was like double you know it was like three you know four now it's like just under five million which is nearly the size of the entire public sector which i think is 5.7 million so the actual traditional self-employed are like enormous part of the chunk of the population and thatcher sort of grew them but as i said she sort of created this electoral coalition this block you know of like the lower middle classes large swathes of the working class what i argue in the book is that since then you know the working class uh conserv working class conservatives and the petty bourgeoisie who were sort of brought into the conservative this ruling block under Thatcherism, haven't really actually had anything. They haven't been given anything at all. They've, the only thing they've got in the world really is is rising house prices, which stop them from falling down back into the working class. That's, so they sort of cling on to that. Then you have Cameron come in, and Cameron is you know is essentially like Tony, you know, very similar to Tony Blair, socially liberal. You know, not doesn't really pay much attention. You know, although self employment actually hit its peak under the coalition cameron himself i don't think really gave it much it didn't really care too much about the the low middle classes as, as his base i you know i thought his base was a bit like blair you know the professional managerial classes then obviously you have the you know brexit and you have the rise of actual far-right brexit party the brexit party ukip and the self-employed so the petty bourgeoisie were the almost definitively one of the main social bases of those sort of new right parties. Then obviously the issue of Brexit temporarily and, and Boris, who I think was a, a very skillful politician for all the, you know, all the criticisms of him and all his awful personal traits, uh, was a, an effective populist. And the issue of Brexit sort of brings back the self-employed who, who were the base of Brexit and UKIP. They are reabsorbed into the Conservative Party. And obviously then there are big issues with the Labour Party, which mean that the people aren't going to vote for them, you know, and for me, a lot of that was about the EU, the, the sort of second referendum, but also it was the fact that sort of the Corbyn, 
there was a moment in 2017 I thought where Corbyn was a really came across as a really anti-establishment uh, politician. Um, there was a difference between the Corbyn campaign in 2019 and the Corbyn campaign in 2017. I didn't think that the Corbyn movement in 2019. I mean, I voted. You know, I I campaigned for him and like I love the guy and I I think he's a, a great uh, sort of principal man, but that for me, some of the demands that were being made and, and if you still look at them now, that the demands of the, his base, this like Corbyn Easter, like young left, a lot of the things that they are asking for aren't departures from liberal capitalism at all. It's things like, you know, open borders, the pro globalization, the pro the EU, you know, identity politics, these things don't really aren't going to have much of an impact on people's, on people's, material circumstances so people want to know about how their lives are going to improve and a lot of this stuff was just not going to appeal to them so there were sort of problems with the labor party i think which just uh, allowed it to be portrayed as this close you know close to the eu close to the establishment but what's happened since i think is really interesting because i don't think that the you know corbyn getting hammered in 2019 is like the death of social democracy or like the death of the left and i certainly don't think that this block of Low middle class, uh, self employed people are innately right wing. I mean, that's the, as I say in the book, that's one of the problems of sort of Marxist analysis over the years that there's an assumption that these people are just a Tory. You know, you're innately Tory, like it's in their DNA to be conservative, um, but it isn't. And like if and, and I I argued this in another podcast the other day. If you if you actually look at what's happening at the moment with the the strength of the trade union movement, I think the trade union movement at the moment. I mean, I well, I would say this, but it's strong and it's popular precisely because it is not seen to have anything to do with the Labour Party. It has nothing to do with like Keir Starmer, it has nothing to do with that managerialism. It's just seen as this organic working class movement. And the strikes are still really popular, which is unprecedented. So that I think at the moment there's a real potential point of unity between the low middle classes, or the, you know, the petty bourgeoisie, and the working classes. And what's happening, the reason I think it's it's in my view, it's doing, I say it's doing well. We're basically at like a Custer's last stand moment. This is the last stand. It is. It's the last stand of the organized working class. The RMT and the CWU, the two biggest working class unions in the UK, you know, are being attacked precisely because they represent the last vestiges of organized labor. But there is far more of a potential for unity when you have a working class led movement with the left you know, us, the young left, the Corbynite left or whatever, and then unions like UCU in the back. That's where we belong. You know, it's not leading it. And that's the difference between now and, and what happened with Corbynism. Because Corbynism was, you know, it was not a work, for all its strength, Corbynism in 2019, Labour was not a working class movement. It didn't have any roots in communities. It didn't have roots in the trade union movement. You know, I mean, although trade unionists supported it, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't a working class movement. It was a mid, it was a, a it was a coalition of progressive elements of the professional managerial class, and but it was mainly the new petty bourgeoisie, just like Syriza, Podemos, and Sanders. And for that reason, it had no basis in the working class, and no, and and it didn't appeal to the the petty bourgeoisie because some of the values that they were being sort of propounded by that sort of Corbynite left, globalization, open borders, it wasn't just that they re were rejected by uh, the sort of low middle class or the petty bourgeoisie or self employed. It was they had fundamentally conflicting class interests. You know, if you're a small business owner or if you're uh, self-employed, these things just were not going to be good for you, for your life this is, is, or your career. It's as simple as that, you know, more bureaucracy um, and so on. But what I really think now is is different. You know, we, now, you know, th there's more of a chance of the self-employed or the traditional petty bourgeoisie getting behind, it might sound counterintuitive, but there's more of a chance of them getting behind someone like Mick Lynch, Eddie Dempsey, uh, Dave Ward, um, than there is getting behind someone like Keir Starmer. And the danger, and the, well, there's a multiple reason for that. One of them is everyone, you know, people recognize others who got doing a hard job. The shared experience of COVID, so many small businesses like went to the wall, but also who sort of kept the country running and who was working during COVID. It was, you know, it was key workers working in supermarkets, public sector workers, um, delivery drivers, and the things that were open and people were relying on were small local shops and things like that so i think there was like a real polarization um in the minds of a lot of people between you know 
are coming together almost between the low middle classes and the working classes in a way that hasn't happened for like a generation. So there's a real potential now at the moment for for unity. The danger of the left, if you just throw this in, danger for the like the, the trade union movement is if they make a pact, like a Faustian pact with Keir Starmer, which is uh, and the Labour Party, which is what happened over like another Europe and the people's vote. It was when Corbyn threw his lot in with the professional manager class. That's the moment when you lose everyone because people hate those people. They hate the Starmers. They hate the establishment. They hate bureaucrats. They hate uh, human resources managers and things like that. And Starmer personifies all that stuff. So as long as the, the union movement sort of remain unhitched and then attached to this like Labour Party, the bureaucratic structure, I think, you know, we could have an, a real anti-establishment movement, but that's just not possible if you linked yourself to the Labour Party. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Your wonderful book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, The Unstoppable Rise of the Petty Bourgeoisie, is out now from all good bookstores. If people want to hear more from you, where can they find you on Twitter? Oh, yeah, I'm at Twitter. Yeah, I've got a new Twitter account, a new sanitized Twitter account, which I'm basically just retweeting praise from my book. Um, <laughs> I'm just pr doing self-promotion, which is horrible. Um, so it's, yeah, at uh, die, so D-A-A, like the name die, and then underscore electic, so dialectic. Um, and obviously, I've run a podcast, uh, a rival podcast called Desolation Radio. I never thought I'd come on. I never thought I'd come on a rival <laughs> podcast. Uh, but it's been a, a, pr a real privilege. So thanks for having me on. Oh, no, thanks so much for coming on, Dan. If you've enjoyed what you've heard this evening, please don't forget to find uh, Hereife on the socials at Hereife Pod. You can go to our website, www.walespolitics.com. Or, and thank you so much for uh, supporting us with your ears. But if you would like to do so with your wallet, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash Hereife Pod. Thank you for listening to Hereife. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.